Hello, my name's Ari Kagan. If you speak Spanish, you've probably already thought of five or six good jokes by now. Being that this is the first episode, I figured I'd tell you some things about myself. I'm 19 years old, I'm 5'10 when I stand up straight, I have green eyes, and dark curly brown hair. And honestly, it's kind of unfortunate that I'm making a podcast, because baldness runs in my family, and I really gotta make use of that hair while I still can. The last thing you should know about me is that I dropped out of school in 8th grade, and have pretty much taught myself ever since. Mostly taught myself things that I don't need to know. So here I am, sharing my passion for useless information with you. Enjoy. Picture this. You walk up the steps to your house, open the front door, and right there in the middle of your living room is a big bag of cat food with a couple wires sticking out of it. Because you live alone, it can only be one of two things. Either the greatest heist master on planet Earth, the cat burglar, has just left their signature calling card, or your own cat is trying to kill you. You approach with caution and notice that your alarm clock has been crudely taped to the bag. This could only be the work of... Hold on. Tigger. Okay. That's the most popular cat name in America. Guess people got tired of all their lasagna being eaten. Anyway, this is the work of your sweet little kitty, Tigger. Having seen many movies and TV shows where they diffuse of bombs, you decide it's probably best to cut the red wire. Or is it the blue wire? But wait, the wires are actually yellow, which, as you're about to find out, is a common problem when it comes to bomb disposal. This is the part of each episode where I say, my name's Ari Kagan, and this is things you don't need to know. But we've already covered that, so um, I guess all you really need to know is that today's guest is Tom Gersbeck. One more quick little disclaimer. If you're currently dealing with a bomb, please call the bomb squad and listen to this podcast later. All right, now that we've gotten all them out of the way, Who is Tom Gersbeck? What does he do? Well, a much better question would be, what does he not do? His career is so impressive. I mean, I'll just read some of the things for you now. He was a Marine, worked in explosive ordnance disposal, taught at Texas A&M, was an explosive security specialist with the Federal Air Marshal. He's also written a book, which is regarded as the book on explosive ordnance disposal. These and many other things make his career incredibly impressive, or as he puts it. (laughs) When you're old, you'll have a lot behind you as well. If you've ever watched a movie where someone needs to defuse a bomb, you've probably seen them have to choose between cutting the red or the blue wire. Is this something that actually happens, or is it just a trope of the silver screen? So, let's say somebody goes to the store to buy wire, and there's only yellow wire. Your ID is going to have all yellow wire. For those of you who don't know, an IED is an improvised explosive device. It's an unofficial bomb made with relatively simple materials. Wire colors really mean nothing, because it's improvised. They're going to use whatever they happen to have laying around. This makes it relatively easy to tell the difference between an IED and something created by a government. If something was made by a country to a specific standard, there's a publication for it, you know, to support its storage, the way it's color-coded, you know, where it's a very regimented type of thing. You know, you can see that just on how it's made, where if it's just some dude in his backyard trying to you know, wrap a bunch of tape around sparklers to make them blow up or something like that. It, it's going to be very crude. It's going to look crude. You, you know, if it has blown up, putting it back together again isn't going to be very difficult. Back in our living room, this is good news. It means our bag of cat food wasn't made by an underground feline government. It also means that we don't know anything about how it works. Fortunately, Tom has a little bit of experience with this. I don't know if you're familiar with the term of submunition. The dictionary definition of submunition is... A small weapon or device that is part of a larger warhead and separates from it prior to impact. If we had, say, 12 techs out there, each day we would probably be destroying in the ballpark between three and 5,000 submunitions, and we'd stay out there for a couple of weeks. So... That'll give you, you know, the numbers get a little crazy. If you don't have a calculator handy, I did the math for you. It's over 4,600 per person over the course of two weeks. But if you're on a bombing range, uh, like in the Chocolate Mountains in the span of four weeks, you might find 150 bombs, 500,000 pound bombs, uh, maybe another 20, 30 rockets, 5-inch, 2.75-inch rockets, 
and, and every now and then, because that range, that's been arranged since before World War II. So you'd actually find some World War II bombs now and then. They'll come up after big storms. Personally, I find it extremely fascinating that we keep finding all these old bombs. Not only that they haven't detonated yet, but just the sheer amount of them that were used in World War II. IEDs, um, well, just in the sexy labs. You didn't mishear that. That's actually what they call their forensics department. It's in essence what happens when EOD techs get to name stuff. So uh, they built forensic labs to process IEDs. And when they were asked what they wanted to call it, they went with Combined Explosives Exploitation Cell. So the initials were C-E-X-C, pronounced sexy. Of course, if you were doing foreign ordnance exploitation, then you could be foxy. So you could be foxy or sexy and... It was a good little running joke for a while. The labs themselves, on the other hand, are no joke at all, as Tom's processed over 1,600 IEDs. Also biometrically processed uh, a little more than 100. Biometric processing is the most in-depth analysis and involves taking apart the entire thing. Unraveling every roll of tape, completely disassembling it. You're running everything for fingerprints. Uh, super glue fuming, just about everything. Uh, any papers that are mixed in there, they tend to wrap paper around batteries, using an hydrant and some other techniques to bring up the fingerprints on paper. So needless to say, you end up using half a dozen, if not more, forensic techniques just processing one IED. Speaking of just one IED, the bag of cat food in our living room has started beeping. Luckily, we have Tom here to help us. What are the steps to properly defusing a bomb? So you, you have something that you think it's an ID. Okay, why? Well, little Johnny has been making bombs, you know, since he's 10 and he's 22 now. And that's right where he always practices. Okay, then there's a good chance that that might be a bomb. You, you know what I mean? It's like, what's the validity of it? In our case, the cat's been after us for years, glaring at us from a chair they'll never let us sit in, meowing with the consistency of Chinese water torture. I think it's pretty obvious that this has been a long time coming. So a lot of it is, where is it? What's going on around it? What made the person who initially called you think that it might be a bomb? Because all of that is really going to help you. And in some cases, you know, look, little Johnny built something in his backyard. I'm not going to try to take it apart and do anything with it. It's homemade. I have no idea what little Johnny's level of chemistry knowledge is or what he might be tinkering with. I'm not going to risk trying to take it apart. I'm just going to blow it up in place. And that's called a bit, blow it in place. How often does that happen? Quite a bit. It really all depends on the situation. Due to the genius of Tigger placing his explosive cat food bag in the middle of your living room, blowing up in place is kind of out of the question. However, in another case where the IED isn't in the middle of a house... You know, you're really just trying to get as much information as you can. The first thing I'm going to do is ask, hey, where are the water lines coming into this neighborhood? Where are the water lines, the gas lines, and the sewer lines? And if they say, oh, you know, they come down the street and then they plug it, oh, if any of those lines run right where little Johnny's thing is, I'm going to try to move it. You're not going to go hands-on with an IED unless somebody's life is at stake. Literally, like it's strapped to somebody or locked to a person. How would you go about moving one of these IEDs? Many of the squads have robots. Uh, some robots are big, some are small. You know, some, if you try to get a robot on an aircraft, if you have a big one, it won't fit. If you have a small one, well, now can I move the item that I need to move? Uh, you know, if you're trying to go in houses, you know, unless it's a tiny robot, it probably has about a 22, 23 inch width. So, uh, you know, can you use your robots? Can you use your x-ray? Can you use your tools? It, it all depends. Things you don't need to know. We'll be right back with more tiny robots and tools right after this commercial break. Lately, I've been listening to Survival Mentality, the psychology of staying alive from The Great Courses Plus. The host, Nancy Zars, teaches you how to strengthen your situational awareness, think in tough situations, and gain knowledge now so that if you ever need it, you'll be ready. It's perfect for those pressure cooker situations such as defusing a bomb. Okay, now we'll just change the music for the rest of the ad. The Great Courses Plus is a streaming service with over 700 college-level courses on almost everything. It's all thoroughly vetted, fact-based information you can trust, and they also have an app so you can learn anytime, anywhere. For a limited time, listeners of this show get an entire month of unlimited access for free by going to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ari. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ari. And if you're thinking to yourself, this seems like a kind of difficult pressure cooker situation. No, it isn't. It's totally free. Just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ari. 
When I first set out to learn how to defuse a bomb, I kind of expected there to be like a one, two, three step procedure. Not that every one of them would be the same, but that there would at least be some type of guide. And it wasn't until around this point in the interview that I realized I was not going to get that answer. I was looking for a specific procedure to defuse every bomb, and that simply doesn't exist. So a lot of times you just have to look at something and say, hey, do I, do I have all the components of an ID here? And the, the components you need, if you remember the word PIES, P-I-E-S, you need a power source, an initiator, you need explosives, and a switch. Back in the living room, Good old crafty Tigger has used an alarm clock as both the power source and the switch. When the clock hits a certain time, it will detonate the explosive, the cat food, via an initiator at the end of the wires. So if you have those things, you're going to have an ID, and that switch can be mechanical or electrical. You can have something as simple as a mousetrap. So we know exactly how Tigger built the thing. We know how it operates, and we're in a race against the clock to disarm it. We achieve this by separating the different elements, starting with the... Well, the bomb detonated for a few reasons, mainly that you're not a professional bomb technician. I'm sorry to say your living room now is a complete mess. Really brings a whole new meaning to that thing my mom used to say whenever we had guests over. The house looks like a bomb went off. Really wish I could stick around to help you clean, but I gotta return some videotapes. Of course, if this was a real IED and not just a bag of cat food, the last phase in its life would be getting handed over to law enforcement. So if something's processed in in a city or a county, that city or county may maintain custody of the evidence for prosecution or whatever, but if it ends up becoming a federal case, it's either gonna be processed by ATF or FBI. And um, if it's processed overseas, then it comes back to the United States to Fort Gordon where the Army has their forensic set up. And the intent is you want to catch the people who did it. It's not just the person who made the IED, but you also want to try to catch the person who provided the supplies for them to build the IED. Uh, if they can't get the supplies, you, they can't make it. Or they have to make something that's much more crude or uh, they make it much more difficult for them to do anything. So if you can stall them of the assets, Uh, that's a good thing. Frequently, movies and television will give us the idea that disarming a bomb is as easy as cutting the blue wire. But in reality, it's not that simple. Each one of these things needs to be dealt with individually and by a trained professional. You've probably uh, heard of the movie or seen the movie The Hurt Locker. There was one quote from it that I exceptionally got a kick out of, and it said, viewed from a half a world away, a bomb is a political concern. Viewed from less than a foot away, a bomb is just a high-risk stakes exercise in problem solving. When making a mistake means a final terminal education in the physics of expanding gases. And that's actually very true. And to be a successful either explosive ordnance disposal technician, like in the military or a public safety bomb technician, you're a problem solver. So oftentimes the tools that you have, you have to kind of wing it. You, you really have to figure things out. So having a good background and just mechanical, electrical, how things work, you know, common sense, and, uh, you know, ability to problem solve. Really, the bottom line, Ari, is I want to try to help people out who are, uh, you know, stuck in a situation dealing with this. And uh, I think you'll find that consistently with bomb techs who really, in essence, we really want to help people out, be able to continue on with their life in a healthy, happy way and not, uh, you know, end up getting themselves hurt in minefields or anything else. If you're interested in learning a lot more about defusing bombs, consider taking a look at Tom's book, Practical Military Ordnance Identification, 2nd Edition. If you simply want to learn a little bit about everything else, this is what we've got for you on the rest of this season. I am an airplane repossession agent. I was the White House correspondent for ABC News. I am the creator and master teacher of speed seduction. They run the Chamber of Commerce. Um, they now have a family member in, as Department of Education head. My first participation in the Satanic Temple was uh, as co-founder of the Albany, New York chapter. Yeah, I'm actually a big believer in uh, uh, Bigfoot. Oh, oh my God. Oh, that's funny. I, I didn't pick up on it. I'm a liar. Were anyone to come along and try to shut them down, they've got someone right there in the room that works for the company and also is supposedly like a politician or a lobbyist or something. We've been shot at a few times. 
we've been chased around an airfield, um, guys swinging a shovel at us. It was interesting because we.